Hello, my name is Benjamin Hart. I'm an American attorney and the managing director of Integrity Legal here in Bangkok, Thailand. As the title of this video suggests, we're discussing cannabis yet again. I think a lot of people are out there saying, Ben, what's the deal? Are you like the pothead lawyer that you're just talking about cannabis all the time? No, it's what I, the reason I'm taking this issue so seriously is because it's one I've been following for quite a while. And here recently, there's been a lot of talk out in, you know, whatever you want to call it, the public forum about... Oh, well, we're just going to we're just going to reclassify this just sort of unilaterally by ministerial decree and all of that ministerial regulation. And I made a video. Many people asked me about it and said, you know, didn't you think that was a little hyperbolic? Candidly, no. You know, at the end of the day, I've seen dictators. I've lived under them. You know, I know what they look like. And when they start walking around, you know, under certain circumstances, I have been okay you know, with, for the exigencies of national security, somebody has to take the reins and do something. What I don't like is arbitrariness and capriciousness about an issue that has had a great deal of benefit for the vast majority of the, the economy here in Thailand, as well as for the people of Thailand that I have witnessed benefit from this. In the past you know, decade, we saw a lot of things, some good, some bad. I think one unequivocally good thing that came about out of the end of the past government was this change with respect to cannabis and cannabis policy and the notion that a quote-unquote democratically elected government comes into office and then just says, well, we're just going to change it. And also after approximately a couple of years now, of Parliament trying to come up with a bill, now comes the Prime Minister out saying, oh, I'm, we're just going to change it unilaterally. We'll just, we'll just rewrite whatever we want. And what's really interesting in all of this, I haven't seen a lot of legal, legally substantive narrative, if you will, explaining why they're able to do this. You know, I've, I've seen people talking about, oh, well, we can do it because we say we can, but I haven't seen a lot of legal basis for that, which is the reason for the title of this video, which is, hey, maybe we'll just throw this to the Constitution court, constitutional court. Let me be clear. I'm a layperson when it comes to Thai law. I am an American attorney. I have experience with comparative law. I am a naturalized Thai. And as a naturalized Thai, I am concerned about procedurally the fact that, as I said in the prior video, what stops this government from saying flowers, for example. You know, florists have to have a special license because we say so. I mean, that's the slope we're on with this. And it's not a slippery slope argument insofar as making the, making the accusation that a slippery slope argument is logically fallacious. That's where we're at. I mean, if they can say this plant, which is clearly not a narcotic, even though at one time... People classified it as that during, let's call it the reefer madness era of jurisprudence here in Thailand. You know, to call this a narcotic is ridiculous in my mind. You know, I, I've said it in other videos, you know, okay, narcotics, they kill people. Fine, let's call that what it is. But this isn't, this doesn't do that. And to see them say, you know, to see a small group, if you will, of politicians here in Thailand and say, well, we'll just rewrite it. We can't get a bill passed. We can't get it through Parliament. We'll just rewrite it on our own, and you just have to put up with it. You know, as I said, you don't get to have it both ways. You know, we do have a democratically legitimate government here in Thailand at the moment, and it's my opinion that they need to process, they need to operate under due process of law. And if you want to change something as fundamental as cannabis law, you need to pass it through Parliament. You know, that's, that's, what I'm, that's the way I see it. And again, I don't have the answers. I'm honestly asking the question in this video, should we have a constitutional court ruling? And let, let me be clear to explain, this is the comparative law aspect of this video. In the United States, our Supreme Court procedure dictates, going back all the way to John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, that you must have a case or controversy in order to bring a matter before the Supreme Court. In the Thai system, so in, in the American system, that prohibits what we call advisory opinions. Basically, opinions where 
a law it might might be passed and the government the, leg, the let's say the legislature in the United States the Congress wants to know hey would the Supreme Court overturn this law under John Jay they set the precedent that no we're not in that business of providing advisory opinions regarding the legality of something that might not have occurred yet and you get into the whole ripeness mootness, standing, issues pertaining to cause of action and stuff like that and how the Supreme Court works. But one of the key bedrocks of the Supreme Court's mandate, if you will, going all the way back to its first chief justice is, look, we don't issue advisory opinions. We don't get political in that way, if you will. We instead issue opinions on cases or controversies. Thailand's court system, as I have observed it over the past 16 years, operates a different way. They actually do issue, in what I would deem in the American legal vernacular, advisory opinions. They they do issue opinions where they say, hey, Parliament, if you pass that, you know, we find that unconstitutional. So my question posed is this notion that, okay, we've tried for a bill, but we don't seem to be able to have one. Now we're just going to We're just going to change everything, change the law without it really going through Parliament. We're we're just going to change the law sort of kind of in like a cabal. Yeah, okay, I shouldn't call it a cabal. They they say they can do it through the cabinet, but it's my understanding that that that's really reserved for issues of exigent need, things like national security. I didn't think, and again, I'm a layman. I'm, I'm genuinely asking these questions. You know, I didn't think that that pertained to something as, quite honestly, as innocuous and as already settled in its own way as cannabis. Cannabis is currently a controlled herb. It has a regulatory structure. It is legal. It's been pulled off the narcotics list. That was done under emergency decree, which which occurred under a previously promulgated set of legislation. And, And from there, it gets very complicated because... Are they able to just relist it as a narcotic without invoked emergency power? It was delisted using invoked emergency power. Now they say they can just relist it without invoked emergency power. And that causes me to then bring up the question, well, what can't you call illegal without invoked emergency power? And again, I think that's a good question for the Constitution Court. That said, I'm, I want to get into some further things here because I think this issue goes even deeper than that. So, quoting directly from a recent article in the Bangkok Post, bangkokpost.com, article is titled, Cannabis U-Turn Could Bring Protests Lawsuits. Quoting directly, the government's move to reclassify cannabis as a narcotic threatens to trigger street protests and class action suits by owners of thousands of dispensaries that have sprung up across the country since decriminalization two years ago. Okay, first things first, and I I really, this is going to be a long video, so those who are watching, strap in. And if you want a little insight in my personal history, you're going to get some here. I was here in 2010, and many others were that I know of as well. There are others who were not, and there are others who seem to have these big issues with cannabis, and I can't figure out why, that were not here in 2010. And when I say I was here in 2010, I was not in some high-rise hotel room, nor was I coming in on a private jet into Cambodia watching from the side, sniping from the sidelines, to quote Billy Bob Thornton in the movie Primary Colors. No, I was here in Bangkok. I was on the ground. I remember when I, at the time, I was exclusively doing U.S. immigration work, and I actually had to travel through the red zone. You had to there were certain motorbike taxis that had gotten, you know, they had the ability to go through that zone to get over to the embassy from down here in Siloam, where our offices were located. You know, I was here for all of that. I was here when it got really bad, too. And, and, it, and it sort of devolved, if you will, into, quite honestly, mob kind of problems. You know, and, and by that I mean, like, really like an angry mob kind of thing. It had to be dealt with. It was dealt with. Nobody liked how it all came out. And I'm here to tell you, I think anybody that went through that who's a reasonable person would prefer not to go through that again. So to those who haven't been here, 
you know, again, let me paraphrase the movie Goodfellas where Joe Pesci says, you know, maybe, maybe you've, been, you've been gone a long time. Maybe nobody told you. We don't want protests here if we can avoid it, especially over innocuous issues that I can't figure out why the, so, the people that are supposed to be elected to operate in the interests of the vast majority of ties operate in the interests of the people seem hell-bent on ignoring what the people need and just dashing their issues, their hopes, their dreams aside in order to do what? Create, you know, make something illegal that shouldn't have been illegal in the... Make something illegal again that shouldn't have been illegal in the first place? To what end? What's the purpose of that? But again, the thing, to, the thing to bear in mind is no one wants to go back to all of that. It was a bad time. You know? So again, if this can be handled amicably, and if our elected representatives in our parliament could sit down and hash this out, rather than wandering around in some kind of ego-driven pageantry, it would be nice. I'm just saying, from the cheap seats, it would be nice. That said, quoting further, a complete recriminalization ordered by Prime Minister Streta Tawisin, let's be clear, not ordered, okay? Again, this notion that I'm just unilaterally calling this illegal. And by the way, I got a lot of problems with the media in all of this because they seem to be operating as a handmaiden for this message that this is some kind of foregone conclusion and the law can just be upended overnight because a couple of people say so, you know, who quite frankly, again, and it also begs the question, why did we go through all the pageantry of trying to pass a bill? Could it be because that was the legitimate way to deal with this? And now they're trying to take some semi-legitimate or even, you know, possibly illegal methodology. Again, I don't know. It's why I want a constitutional court ruling on this at this point, if it's possible. Again, I don't know the procedure for that as a layperson. And I'll get into that here in a second. But again, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really don't like how this has even been framed as, oh, no, no, this, this is legit. This can just happen. This is just happening. You know, what is that media? What, and what is the point of the media anymore? Honestly, post-COVID, what is the point of you folks? What, what did you, you know, after all the time of the people that were actually trying to get real true information out, they were called all kinds of disinfo people, anti this, anti that. And where were you? What, what proper, what correct information did you come out with from the gate? Media? You know, and yet again, here we are, and I don't see any correct information on this whole issue, procedural or otherwise, coming out of much of anywhere the media. Requoting, a complete recriminalization ordered by Prime Minister Sreta Tawisin on Wednesday will also push the cannabis trade underground, said Ratnapon Sanrak, owner of Bangkok-based dispensary Highland Cafe. Yeah, good point. Quoting further, writing uh, Thailand's cannabis future, an advocacy group said it would hold a protest against the move in Bangkok on May 16th. Again, not saying these folks don't have a legitimate interest in protesting. What I'm saying is, where is the government? Where are the cooler heads? Where are the reasonable people? We don't need this now. We need our parliamentarians to sit down and hash this out come up with a real promulgated law. Quoting further, cannabis currently enjoys the status of a quote-unquote controlled herb and there is no outright ban on its recreational use, which has allowed nearly 8,000 dispensaries to open since it was removed from the narcotics list in June 2022. Mr. Stretta's directive, again, not an order, it's a directive. He said this is what he wants. It's like when a prime minister comes in and says, well, this is going to be our new policy. Well, that's great. You have to implement it. You got to put it through Parliament. You don't just get to say this is how it is. Quoting further, to relabel cannabis as a Category 5 narcotic will make it a crime to, quote, produce, sell, import, export, or possess the plant, the plant. Again, that, that to, my, to my, and I, I know people out there are going to say, well, oh, cocaine comes from plants. It's massively processed. Opium comes from plants. Massively processed. Okay, and by the way, I get the argument in those cases, they can kill people. 
you know, nobody's dying from this. Why are we wanting to call it a narcotic? Could, be, could it be because there are special interests out there that want it to be called a narcotic again? Could, could big alcohol and big pharma not like the fact that cannabis just on its own, it's in its own natural state, is cutting into their profits? Could that be, could that perhaps be a motive for this massive, you know, pearl-clutching campaign against the the devil's lettuce or whatever they call it, you know, I mean, it's getting ridiculous here. And use it according to, to drug laws. It, again, I, the framework here was well thought out. Controlled herb is a good idea. Again, you got to be 20 to buy it. You can't be pregnant to buy it. Basic stuff. You know, I've said from the get-go, make criminal penalties if you sell it to children. Fine. You know, why are we calling something a narcotic that isn't a narcotic? To quote from the series Rome, when it came out on HBO, there's a great line where Brutus, I think, is talking to Marcus Aurelius or Cassius, I can't remember who, but he says, you can call a cat a fish, but you can't make it swim. You know, I mean, you can call something whatever you want, but there's a certain point where it's attenuated from reality. It's not, it's not the thing you're calling it. And when you start using ridiculous words, it becomes like Marxism, where you just as Lenin said, we shall win by slogan, you know, because they just make up the language. It's ridiculous. Quoting further, cannabis for medical and health purposes would be allowed, according to the premier, but, but the government gets to dictate what that entails. And not through due process, not through the elected representatives elected by the Thai people in the Thai parliament. No, just us, a couple of guys that we say so. Quoting further, we're all doing everything by the book, but then suddenly the book is going to change, Mr. Ratapon said. We're gearing up to protest and preparing to file lawsuits in the event it happens. I get where they're coming from. I would really like to see some cooler heads here. And as I'll get into, there do appear to be some. But again, it would be nice if, again, those, you know, you haven't been around in a while. Again, to quote Joe Pesci, Goodfellas, you know, maybe nobody told you, you know, things are a little different now. To paraphrase, I should say, Pesci. Quoting further, the policy reversal is part of ruling Puatai Party's hardline anti-drug campaign. Earlier this week, Mr. Shredda gave a 90-day deadline for law enforcement and local authorities to crack down on drugs on, in 25 provinces considered as quote-unquote red zones. And they get into that further in the article. I urge those who are, who are interested, check that out. That being said, I want to quote again, the policy reversal is part of ruling Puatai's, Puatai Party's hardline anti-drug campaign. Yeah, except for meth. When they said meth, you could have five pills of meth. You know, and now they're like, well, two is too much, but one you can... But, I mean, this, this is the ridiculousness of this. There's an attack on cannabis as a narcotic, and yet methamphetamine is just walking around, you know, like, oh, well, what, what's the big deal with that? I want to be clear. I'm not making this for hyperbole purposes, okay? I do agree with the notion of regulation. I really do, actually. I really, really do, I, from tax standpoint and everything else. But to make an 180-degree turn like this looks really bad to the world. You know, I, I mean, folks that might want to invest from the outside in this industry, and let's be honest, cannabis could be huge agribusiness. I'm from Kansas. I know agribusiness. This, we're on the cutting edge here, Thailand. We can all benefit from this. As we say back home, this is high cotton forever if we want it to be. But instead, we got a bunch of pedantic politicians running around trying to screw it up for everybody else. The Boom Jai Thai Party, which spearheaded decriminalization, again, the media on this, I love it. I love it. Just the constant semi-obfuscation. It wasn't decriminalized. It was legalized. That, that's the opposite of something being illegal. It's legal. You know, I've really hated watching this just generally in the legal space, this devouring of self-evident and very precise notions into this very murky, nebulous world of, well, we can always tell you no, You'll, you know, it's nanny state BS using these kind of weasel words, you know, to, to, to just kind of take things halfway. They're half measure words. And there's a reason for it. 
because again, they want to, they, folks, there is a certain contingent, if you will, in this world that enjoys being a nanny state, a nanny. And this is the methodology they use to exert their nanny control, if you will. Quoting again, the Boom Jai Tai Party, which spearheaded decriminalization under the previous administration and is now part of the current coalition, said a bill to regulate rec- recreational use would be more effective than outline- outlawing the plant entirely. Yeah, they're absolutely correct. More to the point, a bill actually promulgated through Parliament would be better than just some back room where this law just magically pops out of. Quoting further, but Mr. Stretta defended the move on Thursday saying, quote, whatever we decide to do, we do it for the people, unquote. You know what that, I love that. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of, go watch the movie Vice with Christian Bale about Dick Cheney. There's a scene in there where they, get, they do a deep dive into what's called the doctrine of the unitary executive or unitary executive theory. Basically, it's along the lines of what President Nixon said when he said, well, when the president does it, it's not illegal. Well, guess what? When the president does stuff, he can do stuff that's illegal. There is no doctrine of unitary executive, in my opinion. It doesn't make any sense, and I don't want to go any deeper into that. But that said... Whenever we, whatever we decide to do, we do it for the people. Really? Because I I haven't seen you caring about any of these small shop owners that are going to be completely upended, have their, have their sweat equity, their, their monetary investment, everything they put into this stuff. You you all just say, oh, that could just go up and smoke. Poof. But we do it for the people. You know, which people? Who are you talking about? You know, and by the way, what people are being directly harmed from this? Let me be clear. I completely understand Thai people who say, we don't like smelling it on the street. It's a nuisance to us. Good. We need a law on that. We already have one. I talked about it. It's the nuisance law. Thai cops should be arresting people that are smoking dope out on the street. I get it. Makes perfect sense to me. You know, make some more laws to that end. But to say like, oh, in your own home, you can't enjoy this for whatever purpose. You know, why is it the government's business? Especially, like, Again, I can see the governmental oversight argument to something that can kill you, where they say, look, you can only get a tincture of opium in this amount, for example, from a, from a physician under certain circumstances. Yeah, because the stuff kills you. You know, in this, in this instance, this substance doesn't kill anybody. And I'm not really saying that hyperbolically. And yes, you can go out and find some statistic of some incident where some person got intoxicated and fell off a roof or something, but you can do the exact same thing with alcohol, and you can definitely do the exact same thing with methamphetamine. So why are we talking in this vernacular like this? So quoting further, the country's nascent cannabis industry has battled legal uncertainty since inception as lawmakers could not agree on how to regulate it. The first attempt to pass a bill to control cannabis use last year was blocked in Parliament as part of political jockeying ahead of the election. Question, what part of the currently governing coalition helped block that legislation? You say you want regulation so bad, why didn't you regulate it? Quoting further, the most recent attempt, on, uh, attempt under the Sreda government to outlaw regu- re- recreational use and tighten licensing rules on planting sales, exports, and imports has been stalled by the bureaucratic process. A change in ministers last week could lead to further delays. I want to go back and say that again. The most recent attempt under the Sreta government to outlaw recreational use and tighten licensing rules on planting, sales, exports, and imports has been stalled by the bureaucratic process. No, it's been stalled by due process. Due process of law, the legislative process. Because that's the way Thailand works. It's a civil law country. It's what I like about it here. You want to make something illegal? Pass a law. You know? And that's the thing. They had the opportunity to do this. And they chose not to. And now they just want to impose it on everybody. You know? Pass it through Parliament. Have a sit down. And by the way, you all get government salaries. You're all paid to be in there. Go sit down. Get in a committee and hash this out. You know, don't put us all in a position where people are out on the streets protesting. All kinds of law cases are going through the law courts because you people won't sit down and do your job. In any event, I was then reading another article in uh, 
Ty Examiner, TyExaminer.com. This is going to be one of the few times where I'm a little bit critical of the old Ty Examiner because I didn't think that the, the title of the article was quite in line with what was really going on here. The headlines seem to want to convey something that, in my mind, is not what's really happening. That said, yet again, Ty Examiner does, you know, they go through the, they, they do the homework, and it's a good article. Article's titled, Anutin Accepts the PM's Line on Pot. That, let me get into that. He now calls for foreigners operating weed shops to be arrested by police. Okay, one side note here. Foreigners, I told you from Jump Street, this stuff was always for the ties, okay? And I know people that really hate me because they contacted us and, and came in and I did consultations and, you know, we talked with the Thai lawyers and things. And I advised, in my capacity as an American attorney, just as sort of a, an observer, I advised many foreigners, you need to stay away from this because this is a Thai thing. And me as a Thai, I actually agree with Anutin's position and, and he's made it clear that, look, you know, and I'm going to do another video contemporaneously with this one, but suffice it to say, you know, Anutin's saying, hey, we're going to be going after foreigners who are in this space because this is a Thailand-specific industry, a Thai-specific industry. It's a restricted industry for Thais. And that's the way Thailand protects its own economy. And on that score, I know I'm going to get burned in the comments, but on that score, and I'm not trying to be hard on foreigners or whatever, I truly feel bad for people that came in, got invested in all of this, and maybe sort of swept up in it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, this is Thailand, so act accordingly. That said, quoting directly, Deputy Prime Minister Anutin appeared resigned to accept the government's decision on the matter when it comes before Cabinet for decision in due course. Well, nah, maybe not. Quote, in brief, he said the Boomjai party would argue the position in Cabinet and vote accordingly. He didn't say he was going along with it. He just said, we're going to vote the way we're going to vote in the Cabinet. And whatever happens, happens. But again, my big question is, after all this time trying to get a bill, why does the cabinet just get to unilaterally pass this without it going through the full House of Parliament? And again, I think that's a question that the Constitutional Court is probably best equipped to answer. Again, I'm a layperson. I don't know if that's true, but I'm asking the question, and I think I know the answer. But I don't know know the answer. You know, I, I don't fully know. I know what I don't know. And I don't know everything there is to know about Thai law. I admit that freely. You know, but that said, I think there's a good question here is whether or not, don't we need a constitutional court ruling on this? Quoting further, it would then accept the government's decision. Well, that's what a good minister does. You know, I, I've been accused in the past of shilling for Anu Anutin. I made a video once where I was trying to expose my own biases and say, you know, I, I had an affinity for Anutin and in all of this that had to do with the cannabis thing in an effort of full, full disclosure. And I still have a certain amount of affinity for him. I have even more of an affinity for him now because he seems to be the only reasonable person that doesn't want to see protests in the street and every, you know, all hell break loose. You know, and I'm not saying that's going to happen. But what I'm saying is I've been there when it did. And we need to take all measures necessary to avoid it. Quoting further, on Thursday, however, the former Minister of Public Health indicated that he reluctantly accepted the call by the PM. At the same time, at the same time, Mr. Arnton made it clear that, that the regulation of cannabis through legislation was a better approach. Darn skippy. Now, moving forward over here to a more recent article in the Bangkok Post, bangkokpost.com. Article is titled, Weed Use Leaps After Law Eased. Quoting directly, the public health minister says cannabis use among young adults is now 10 times greater when compared to two years ago before decriminalization. Again, legalization. Legalization. A thing is either legal or illegal. I don't know what this decriminalized is. It means the cops aren't doing their job. No, the cops are doing their job. They're following the law. And there isn't a law on this. Quoting further, and he believes the government's plan to relist cannabis as a narcotic must be based on scientific reasoning. Well, <laughs> okay, I guess that's a self-evident statement. But the, the one going back here, the public health minister says cannabis use amongst young among young adults is now ten times greater. It's legal. Of course, it's ten times greater. These are people that weren't doing it when it was illegal because they're law-abiding citizens. Yes, of course, it's, it's greater. 
Now, here's a question for you. Is murder up 10 times more that cannabis is legal? Is person crime up 10 times more that cannabis is legal? I don't think so. Meanwhile, what is up? Well, we've seen a new industry that popped out of the woodwork some two years ago and saw a $1 billion market cap within seven weeks. We, hey, I'd love to know also, what are the statistics on whether or not commercial property prices are up in tourism-related centers, and how does that correlate with the opening of cannabis shops? Quoting further, as for cannabis businesses concerned about the policy flip-flop, Mr. P- Mr. Salmsack said, the Narcotics Control Board decided to delist cannabis at the time, but that doesn't mean the decision is unchangeable. Okay, nobody's saying it's not unchangeable. It's the way you're changing it that we have a problem with. It was delisted under emergency power, okay? Now, there is no emergency decree currently operating. So how can it be relisted without emergency power without going through due process of going through parliament? Again, a good question, I would think, for the constitutional court. Quoting further, quote, If there is change, it will be for the benefit of the people. I will invite all stakeholders to come to a consensus on the issue. Well, thank God there's another reasonable person in the room. You know, and I think if this is how this person's talking, again, what's, what's his name again? The um, Sam Tepsutin. So, again, if this is the new public health minister and this is how he's talking, I think we should give him a chance. Let's listen to him because he sounds like at least trying to be reasonable. That, that's nice to see. Prime Minister Sretatawisin recently said he wanted to... I, I love the verbiage here. It starts off, it's ordered. It's a foregone conclusion. Then, then it becomes a directive. Now it's he wanted. Well, yeah, because he can't just say this. It's like saying a bouquet of roses is illegal from one day to the next. It doesn't make any sense. Prime Minister Sretatawisin recently said he wanted to put cannabis back on the narcotics list with an unclear explanation as to how it might get done. Quoting further, Meanwhile, the Ministry of Public Health has not yet spelt out how it might seek to amend the laws on cannabis, saying it needs to listen to stakeholders first. Good. Thank you. At least a little bit of consideration would be nice. There are a lot of people out here that are... I was down just recently. I was in Jomtian Beach over this past weekend. Really love Jomtian. And I went into this, this, little, this guy's little cannabis shop. He's a Thai guy. I would say he's probably late 20s, early 30s, although with ties, a tie can be 78 years old and look 22. You know, I mean, ties, it's like they don't age or something. But I'm pretty sure this guy was probably in his early 30s at the latest. And I, and I went in there, and we were talking, and he said he owned three shops. He said he owned three shops between John T. and Beach and all the way down in Rayong. He had three shops. And I'm sitting there going, you know, here's a late 20s, early 30s guy. He's got a business going. He's paying some taxes. He's adding to the community. He's paying some rents into the commercial real estate sector. Why are we hassling this guy? This is the guy. You know, who was it? Phil Graham back in the United States. He was a, I think it was a senator or governor for a while. He tried to run for president. I remember way back in the day, uh, he was in the Republican National Committee. My dad took me there when I was in like kindergarten. It was when Dole ran against Bush. Bush the first, George H.W. Bush. But Phil Graham had this thing where he would say there are people pulling the wagon and there are wagon pullers and then there are people in the wagon. And what he was saying was there's people on, in any given society, there's people who are freeloaders, who are in the wagon, living off of taxes, uh, uh, politicians? Who, uh, uh. And then there are the people pulling the wagon. Guy with a business, three businesses, who's selling stuff that people want to buy, paying taxes, paying his rent. Presumably, if he's got three places, he's paying employees. He's paying for products. He's transacting in the business community. That's a wagon puller. We want more wagon pullers. We don't want people in the wagon. I especially don't like people in the wagon telling the wagon pullers that what they're doing is illegal. Quoting further... Supachai Jaisamut, advisor to Deputy Prime Minister Anutin Chan Widokun and member of a and member of a Boomjai Thai party, I think they meant the Boomjai party, which spearheaded the unlocking of cannabis from the narcotics list in the previous government, said the Sreta administration has clearly spelled out a case for continuing use of cannabis for medicine and health. Well, that's great, 
But, you're, you know, I get what is trying to be done here. They're trying to create a framework whereby it can be tracked a little bit more easily. Again, I think it's a great thing. Criminal penalties. If you sell to kids, you do time. I have nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with taxes. You know, tax it. You know, but again, they, I, they say, I see what you're doing. It's, you're trying to put it into this medical rubric and then that allows for more control and more tax. The problem is it's not how it started, and we've already come down this road, and you're looking to change it on people, basically pull the rug out from under people without due process of law. That's what bothers me, is that it looks to me like there's a lack of due process of law here. Again, it's more... I, I only came upon that... This issue I'm more passionate about than anything. The notion they can just, again, like I made the video, this bouquet of flowers is now illegal because... We say so under ministerial regulation. Well, neat. You know, I mean, but oh, so, so then tomorrow, and again, alcohol producers, you should be looking at this and thinking about it. Because if they can say from one day to the next that one plant or, or process plant, however you want to look at it, can just be deemed to be a narcotic or whatever, what about your business? What happens if they maybe want more taxes on you and they want to call alcohol something it isn't or higher grade alcohol or something of this nature? What's the difference between beer and spirits? The government also has a policy to increase the economic value of cannabis, which received consensus from all government parties, he added. So the best solution is to have a law to control cannabis use. Yes, exactly. Quoting further. He added that in his view, Thailand must have a law to control its use, not relist cannabis as a narcotic. Well put, well put. Quoting further, he said the party has done its job by drafting a revised cannabis legislation and has submitted it for Parliament's consideration. It should be supported by all parties, he said. And he's bringing up what I'm trying to bring up here is, I want to see Parliament do this. I don't want to see some closed-door back room come out with something and just say, this is how it's going to be from now on. You know, Parliament really needs to work this out. And I'm really getting tired of all these so-called espousers of democracy talking about it. And then when we get a democratic institution like our Parliament, they don't want to use it. Is it because they don't want to use it because the voice of the people isn't going the way that they want it to go? That I ask you. But that said, the one thing I do know, the one thing I definitely know, I would much rather see this matter adjudicated through legal process preferably preferably do legislative process and promulgation of a law. But, you know, again, I, at the end of the day, would much rather see a constitutional court ruling rather than protests in the streets.